This is the story of two men. One was American, the other was Indian. Both were lawyers, both were family men, both endured decades of struggle, both made immense sacrifices, both moved mountains to ascend to the pinnacle of national leadership. Both played a critical, pivotal role in shaping their nation's destiny. One came to be recognized as his nation's greatest president. The other went on to be revered as a saint, a Mahatma, the father of his nation. Both would eventually fall to an assassin's bullets. And as national leaders, they both found themselves staring at the same stark choice, partition or civil war. Who made the right choice? Was it Abraham Lincoln who went to war when the southern states seceded from the United States of America over the issue of slavery? Or was it Mohandas Gandhi who agreed to India's partition when faced with Muhammad Ali Jinnah's threat of a civil war that would pit Muslims against Hindus and Sikhs? Let's find out starting with Abraham Lincoln's story. Abraham Lincoln was born on February 12, 1809 in Kentucky, United States. In 1834, Lincoln was elected to the Illinois State Legislature, where he gained a reputation as an eloquent speaker and a skilled debater. He was a strong advocate for individual rights, including the abolition of slavery. The central theme of Lincoln's political career and also his legacy was his fight against slavery. Slavery was practiced in North America right from the time of the European colonization of the Americas, which began in 1492. The first African slaves were transported to the British colonies in North America in the first quarter of the 17th century. In 1860, the total population of the US was approximately 31 million people. Of this total, only half a million were Native Americans and approximately 12 million were African origin slaves. Think about it, almost 40% of the American population was enslaved. Slavery was central to the economy of the United States. Slavery allowed for the production of cash crops such as tobacco and rice and cotton, which were major exports and major sources of income for the United States. The labor of enslaved people was essential for the profitability of large-scale plantations, which were the backbone of the US economy, especially in the southern states. Slaves were also used for mining and construction and other forms of labor that were crucial for the growth of the US economy. The use of slaves in agriculture and industry allowed for the expansion of US territory and the development of new regions such as the Southwest. The wealth generated by slavery helped finance the American Revolution and other early national projects such as the construction of the Capitol and the White House. This exploitation of slaves contributed to the growth of the textile industry as cotton produced by slaves was processed and manufactured into textiles. Now, in the 18th and 19th centuries, the northern states began to industrialize. This led to the development of labor-saving devices and technology and other innovations that reduced the need for manual labor, for slave labor. This gradually led to a shift towards wage labor and away from the use of enslaved labor in manufacturing. These northern states had a more developed transportation infrastructure, which made it easier to transport goods and people without relying on slave labor. The growth of wage labor in the northern states led to a greater demand for immigrants and free African Americans to work in factories and other industries. These northern states had a more diverse economy that was less reliant on cash crops such as cotton that required the use of slave labor. Because of these economic and technological factors, the northern states gradually began to abolish slavery during the late 18th and early 19th centuries. These northern states had a larger population than the southern states, which meant that they had more political power and could push for the abolition of slavery throughout the United States to the detriment of the less developed southern states. And Abraham Lincoln's election as president in 1890 sparked a crisis in the South. South Carolina became the first state to secede from the Union. 
by January 1861, Mississippi and Florida and Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana and Texas had also seceded from the Union. By February that year, the Confederate States of America was formed with Jefferson Davis as its president. Soon, other states like Virginia, Arkansas, North Carolina and Tennessee also seceded from the Union and joined the Confederacy. So Abraham Lincoln, the newly minted president of the United States, was left with two options. Either accept the partition of the United States or go to war against the Confederacy. He chose war. The American Civil War began in April 1861. It was a brutal conflict, the most deadly conflict in US history until that point in time. Approximately 2% of the US population died in combat and hundreds of thousands more died of disease. To make a long story short, the Civil War ended on April 9, 1865 with the surrender of the Confederate forces. Abraham Lincoln had succeeded in protecting the unity and territorial integrity of the United States. Six days later, on April 14, 1865, Lincoln was assassinated by a Confederate sympathizer named John Wilkes Booth. Lincoln's legacy continues to be celebrated and studied today. His life and leadership continue to inspire Americans. He is widely regarded as one of America's greatest presidents and his influence on American society and history and culture is immense. Now let's talk about Mohandas Gandhi. Mohandas Gandhi was born on October 2, 1869 in Porbandar, a coastal town in Gujarat, India. He was born into wealth and power. His father, Karamjan Gandhi, was a chief minister of Porbandar and later became the Diwan or Prime Minister of the princely state of Rajkot. Mr. Gandhi's life and political career must be examined in the context of the British occupation of India. The British East India Company was founded in 1600 near the end of the Elizabethan era and its purpose was to trade with India. At that time, India was incredibly prosperous. In fact, India was the world's uh, largest economy for the best part of the past two millennia. The East India Company hoped to dip into some of this incredible wealth and enrich its stakeholders, its shareholders and the English crown in the process. It succeeded beyond the wildest dreams of its shareholders. By the first quarter of the 19th century, the East India Company had defeated the immense Maratha Empire and seized control of large parts of India. It managed to survive India's first war of independence in 1857, after which the British crown assumed direct control of India in the form of the British Raj. The British rule over India was brutal. The British killed roughly 10 million Indians in reprisals in the aftermath of 1857 itself. And they engineered countless artificial famines year after year after year, which killed well over a hundred million Indians. And this ended with the Bengal famine of 1943. In the process, the East India Company and the British stole over 45 trillion dollars worth of wealth and resources from India, reducing the world's richest civilization to rubble and dooming hundreds of millions to desperate poverty. It is in this context that we must examine Mr. Gandhi's life and career. Mr. Gandhi migrated to South Africa in 1893 to work as a lawyer for an Indian merchant in Pretoria. Indians naturally faced appalling discrimination in South Africa under British rule. In 1894, Mr. Gandhi formed the Natal Indian Congress to advocate for the rights of Indian immigrants in South Africa. He soon developed the concept of Satyagraha, passive non-violent resistance and used it to campaign for better treatment of Indians. In 1899, Mr. Gandhi sided with the British Empire during the Anglo-Boer War and formed the Natal Indian Ambulance Corps to provide medical assistance to wounded British soldiers. He even petitioned the British government to allow him and other Indians to fight for the British. Ashwin Desai and Gulam Wahed's book, The South African Gandhi, Stretcher Bearer of Empire, shows that Mr. Gandhi demonstrated through his actions a strong loyalty 
to the British Empire. The book examines Mr. Gandhi's role as a stretcher bearer during the Anglo-Boer War and shows that his actions during the war were motivated more by his loyalty to the British Crown than by any sense of anti-imperialism or anti-racism. After the Anglo-Boer War, Mr. Gandhi continued to lead non-violent protests and civil disobedience campaigns in South Africa. His emphasis was always on passive resistance and non-violence. Mohandas Gandhi returned to India from South Africa in 1915 at the age of 46 as a celebrity. He immediately joined the Indian National Congress, which was created by the British bureaucrat Alan Hume in 1885. And Mr. Gandhi very rapidly became one of its most powerful leaders. Now, in 1906, the All India Muslim League was founded to represent the political interests of Indian Muslims. This was part of a long-running British policy of divide and rule, which sought to create internal divisions and tensions within India. In 1919, the Muslim League supported the Khilafat movement, which called for the Indian Muslim population to support the Ottoman Caliphate in Turkey and to protest against the British government's policies in Turkey. Clearly, this issue had nothing to do with India and India's freedom struggle. That same year, Mr. Gandhi endorsed the Khilafat movement and amplified the Khilafat leaders' views and ideology. By 1921, Mr. Gandhi had become the undisputed leader of the Indian National Congress. In 1922, the Khilafat movement's leaders criticized Mr. Gandhi for his commitment to non-violence and broke their ties with him. This movement, the Khilafat movement, fizzled out in 1924 when the Turkish dictator Mustafa Kemal Ataturk abolished the Caliphate. And yet this Khilafat movement had a powerful cascading impact on the Indian freedom struggle. It became the catalyst for the demand for an Islamic Pakistan separate from India. In 1934, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, an erstwhile Indian nationalist who had opposed the formation of the Muslim League in 1906, returned to India after 14 years in the political wilderness. He set out to work for a separate homeland for India's Muslims. He set out to work towards partitioning India and creating a separate nation of Pakistan out of Indian territory. This also happened to be Britain's end game their exit policy for India. Now, Mr. Gandhi was deeply opposed to India's partition. Mr. Gandhi said that India's partition would happen over his dead body and he undertook several fasts to try and prevent the partition. And yet India was partitioned on August 14, 1947 and received dominion status, not independence, on August 15, 1947. Mr. Gandhi then proceeded to coerce, arm twist, the Indian National Congress into appointing the unpopular Jawaharlal Nehru, who happened to be favoured by the British as India's first Prime Minister. On January 30, 1948, Mr. Gandhi was assassinated by Nathuram Godse. So now that we have examined and compared the careers and choices of Abraham Lincoln and Mohandas Gandhi, we must ask ourselves, who made the right choice? Was it Abraham Lincoln who went to war when the South seceded from the US over the issue of slavery? Or was it Mr. Gandhi who agreed to India's partition when faced with uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah's threats of a civil war, which would pit Muslims against non-Muslims? So here are the plain facts. After Mr. Lincoln's death, the United States went on to become a superpower. It is still the world's most prosperous and powerful nation. On the other hand, after Mr. Gandhi's death, India failed to live up to its immense potential in the 20th century. It remained an extremely poor nation with hundreds of millions of citizens suffering from crushing poverty. India is still a third world nation that is only now beginning to emerge as a major economic power in the third decade of the 21st century. It's taken that long. And what about Pakistan? 
Pakistan has forced India into four wars thus far. It has become the global epicenter of terrorism and the civil war that Mr. Gandhi sought to avoid has taken on a nuclear dimension. So who made the right choice? Who set his nation on the path to success and prosperity? And who set his nation on the path to further ruin? I think it's pretty clear that Mr. Lincoln made the right choice, an extremely difficult choice, but the right choice nevertheless in the long run. So what could Mr. Gandhi have done differently? One way of answering this question is to ask ourselves, what would Abraham Lincoln have done if he were in Mr. Gandhi's position? Or what would the great statesman Vishnu Gupta Chanakya have done? Let's not forget that Chanakya defeated and dismantled the oppressive and immensely powerful Nanda Empire, which even Alexander could not conquer and establish the Mauryan Empire in its place. How would Chanakya have dealt with the British occupation and the prospect of India's partition. What would Chinggis Khan have done if he were in Gandhi's place? What would Mustafa Kemal Ataturk have done? What would Joseph Stalin have done? What would Mao Tse Tung have done? All of these leaders faced almost impossible odds and succeeded. Their careers gave us viable models of what approaches could have been taken to liberate a unified India from British occupation. For instance, Mao Tse Tung, the Chinese dictator, would have opposed the British occupation in a very different way from Mr. Gandhi. He would have launched a guerrilla war against the British across the country. What did India have to lose? Anyway, the British had completely destroyed India economically. They had drained India of its immense wealth. They were killing hundreds of thousands of Indians every year and life expectancy in India had fallen below 30. Can you imagine that? So India had absolutely nothing to lose and everything to gain, which is why a guerrilla war would make a lot of sense. So Mao would have led a nationwide sustained guerrilla campaign to demoralize and defeat the British forces. The military campaign would only end with the surrender or defeat of the British forces and the liberation of a unified India. That's what worked for Mao in China and that's whatever what he would have done in India. And we can very well imagine what Chinggis Khan would have done to deal with the British if he were in Mr. Gandhi's place. It would be a campaign of all-out sustained violence until victory was achieved. But we know that Mr. Gandhi abhorred violence. So did Mr. Gandhi have any non-violent means of defeating the British? As it turns out, he did. We know that everyone in India revered and worshipped Mr. Gandhi. He was regarded as a great spiritual leader, a dharma guru. People were willing to give up their lives at his command and lots of people actually did. So here is the critical question. Why did Mr. Gandhi never ask the British Indian Army to launch a Satyagraha, a non-violent, non-cooperation movement against the British? The soldiers would have obeyed him. This is a guarantee. In fact, the British Indian Navy did precisely this in February 1946. They revolted peacefully against British rule, mostly peacefully, and stopped obeying orders. The British Empire lost control of the Indian Navy overnight. Over 20,000 sailors in 78 ships deployed across a vast area from the Persian Gulf to the Malacca Strait. Had the Indian army come to know about the naval revolt and joined in the rebellion, the British Empire would have collapsed like a pack of cards. Why? Because the Indian armed forces, which Britain controlled, were the key to British rule in India. The British ruled India through force. Without that key, they could not rule. So the British Raj was on the brink of collapse and disintegration in February 1946. So what did Mr. Gandhi do? Mr. Gandhi nipped the rebellion in the bud by dispatching Mr. Patel to negotiate with the naval officers and make them surrender. Mr. Patel succeeded and the rebellion was quashed after just one week. Had Mr. Gandhi supported a non-violent rebellion, a satyagraha by the Indian Navy and the armed forces, British rule in India would have ended overnight without any violence and partition would not have happened. 
as simple as that. And communal violence could have been avoided by dealing robustly with the key politicians who sought to fan the flames of religious hatred. People like Jinnah and Suhravardi and others. The Indian state apparatus was perfectly capable of dealing with such mischief mongers with an iron hand. So what does this tell us? It tells us that Mr. Gandhi could have ended British rule in India overnight and prevented India's partition all without any violence if he so wished. He chose not to. The essence of leadership is service. Service of a finite constituency. For national leaders, that finite constituency is the nation and its people. True leaders do not rule, they serve the nation and its people. False leaders serve hidden interests. Who does Kim Jong-un serve in his capacity as the supreme leader of North Korea? Who did Dr. Manmohan Singh serve when he was India's prime minister? Who does the Pakistani prime minister serve? Does he serve the Pakistani nation and its people? Or does he serve the Pakistani army? And who does the Pakistani army serve? Does it serve the Pakistani nation and its people? Does the Pakistani army serve itself? Or does the Pakistani army serve external powers? Who did Abraham Lincoln serve? Who did Mohandas Gandhi serve? I leave the answers to you. Thank you for watching.